You see okay there? Oh. Okay. All right, so uh, take it away, Josh. Oh, well, thanks a lot, Phil. Um, it's been a while since I've chatted with the Victoria Natural History Society, um, one of my favorite organizations that I was mentioned. Um, and since the last time I spoke, we discussed some of the research we were conducting on transients, and I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, but I have more results and more interesting findings that um, have now kind of spurred more questions. And um, I'm sure in the next couple of years, we'll have another one of these talks, hopefully, and I can share more results. Um, but first off, um, I just want to acknowledge um, my colleagues, as well as the organizations I co collaborate with, um, which is the Pacific Wildlife Foundation, um, who I'm also a, an associate with, uh, as well as our the Marine Mammal Research Unit, the Oceanic Ecology Research Group. Uh, so really, the, the big question today I'm going to be talking about is, well, what is going on in the open ocean um, with killer whales? And it'll be about an area that's outside of what we're usually talking about, which is the Salish Sea with the southern resident killer whales, but more so talking about the outer coasts of California and Oregon. Um, one sec here, see if, oh, there we go. Um, so first off, uh, I spent a lot of time in British Columbia, but I also spent a lot of time in California now. Uh, if if you've ever been to Monterey Bay, it's a it's a beautiful place. It's kind of a second home for me now, um, and it's a spectacular place just to see marine wildlife. And it's kind of where a lot of my work started in 2015, um, studying killer whales. I I ended up going down there after studying killer whales in the Salish Sea since the early 2000s, and I just found it was such a great opportunity to try to to connect um, killer whale ecology and knowledge throughout the entire coast. Uh, so today's talk, um, I'm going to be covering a few things. Some some, some objectives of the talk um, is that I want to provide a, some baseline information on what the predatory role of transient killer whales is in the California current large marine ecosystem, which I'll, des I'll describe that ecosystem in detail, um, and also to assess the community structure of the West Coast transient killer whale stock, which um, we're kind of in the middle of trying to figure out based on a large spatial scale study, uh, which is part of the work I'm doing with UBC. And uh, then also the last thing would be to provide information on seasonal occurrence, prey species and habitat use patterns of transient killer whales on the outer coast of California and Oregon. So to do this, um, we've been, we did three uh, studies um, that are currently now kind of in the final stages, uh, but here I'll be sharing the preliminary results of that kind of highlight um, what this work has been like for us and and what we found. So first off though, transient killer whales. Um, we all know the resident orcas, which are uh, the salmon eating killers we've seen the Salish Sea, especially the southern residents. Uh, but their closely related cousin, uh, the transient killer whale is um, the apex predator in the along the Pacific coast of North America. They're mammal hunting specialists and they're um, but potentially they've seen all the way from the Chukuk Sea to all the way down to um, Southern California. So this is a, a an art piece of showing a male and female transient killer whale. And you can see the large male here, uh, distinguished by tall dorsal fin, um, large pectoral fins, curled flukes, um, and then this gray saddle patch and eye patch. Female has the same kind of characteristics, but they're quite a bit smaller. Don't present this large dorsal fin that the males have um, and more of a smaller pectoral fin. So transient killer whales, as mentioned, they're found um, throughout the northeastern Pacific Ocean, and you can see, but it gets a little bit more convoluted and interesting. Um, we know of a few different pop genetically distinct populations, um, or genetically, acoustically, morphologically distinct uh, throughout this region, um, and kind of highlighted here in the colors, uh, you can see up here in Alaska and in towards the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands, we have this uh, also a poorly known group called the Gulf of Alaska transients. Um, but we're now realizing that some of the research has been conducted by NOAA, um, the NOAA's National Marine Mammal Laboratory, that this stock likely um, involves a few other populations um, that could be into the Bering Sea, into the Aleutians, and the Gulf of Alaska. So um, I, I've heard recently that they're kind of been talking about uh, reassigning this population uh, based on some of the new genetics analysis that's been conducted. Um, the other one, though, this little blue area here in um, Prince William Sound in the Kenai Fjords um, belongs to a, a special group called the AT1 transients, and there's only seven left um, 
in the world, seven individual whales in this population. And they're genetically distinct from the Gulf of Alaska that live sympatrically with them. Um, they don't interbreed and they haven't had a calf since the 1980s. Uh, they were first discovered they were in 1984. They numbered 22 whales, um, and then shortly after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, they declined uh, all the way down to seven now, and with no reproductive female. So they will go extinct likely in the near future. I think they've only now identified four in the last two years. Um, the other population, though, which is what we're really interested in, and there's big question marks around it, is the West Coast population. And what's interesting about that is that they're by far the best study. Um, they have been studied since the 1970s. Uh, they're been cataloged by researchers all along the Pacific Coast. And what we do know is that um, there is a group, that, and most, with most studies actually occurring in the Southeast Alaska region, um, all the way down to Vancouver Island and Washington, uh, being this West Coast group. But we, what we do know is that the West Coast population also extends all the way down the coast to South, Southern California. And this was one of the first reports that came out in the 1990s that suggested that is, we should be considered one population. Uh, but recently there's been a lot of interesting information coming out suggesting that uh, this population might be more than one population or stocks of um, within the West Coast population that have distinct distributions and habitat use patterns. Uh, but there seems to be, once again, this big question mark, um, also a big question mark, of what is the distribution of transient killer whales in open ocean habitats? Um, from surveys conducted by scientists, uh, NOAA, um, NOAA Fisheries, as well as Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, we do know that killer whales do occur out here in the open ocean. Uh, this is usually during big marine mammal surveys. And, uh, but the real question is, what are they doing out there? So that's where I got really interested. I spent a lot of time out at sea over the years, um, in particular working on fisheries observer, observer boats, um, aboard, aboard fishing boats uh, as a fisheries observer, also working with National Geographic and Lindblad expeditions offshore, um, and also working in pelagic habitats, um, such as Monterey Bay, California, and offshore of the Oregon coast. So the big question, what is going on out there in the big blue? Uh, this photograph right here was taken by Southwest Fisheries Science Center at NOAA. And it consisted of a group of killer whales you can see here um, that were other than the male right here, which is an interesting story. You can see the big fin on the, the, the right. None of these individual whales were known to anyone. They weren't in any publication, any catalog that we knew um, except for the male. And the only reason we knew they were transient uh, was the fact, the fact that the male had been linked in association with other transient killer whales in the past. So that was really exciting. Uh, but the open ocean has a lot of um, interesting things. Uh, so for instance, our primary study and for this talk is the Oregon coast down to um, central California is kind of the main area that we've been studying and out to about 500 and, uh, 565 kilometers offshore through the NOAA surveys. What we do know, though, is that a few different animal types of killer whale or ecotypes, which is a, a morphologically and um, genetically distinct grouping um, of killer whale or, or sinus orca, are found in the open ocean. So, for instance, we have this um, outer coast group right here that we're, we're kind of thinking about, this group of transients that spend time out of the op open ocean and the outer coast waters. Um, they're potentially, we all know about these offshore killer whales that have been studied since the 1980s. Um, but there's a population that are primarily fish eaters, uh, similar to residents, but they eat higher up on the food chain, typically sharks. And then we also know a potential, which is kind of interesting from some of these sightings, is that a, there's a lot of individual whales out there we've cataloged, which I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation, that don't really fit into the umbrella of offshore transient. We're not even sure. They have not been linked through association, and uh, none of the genetics work has been done on them. Uh, so the ecosystem, though, that I'm quite fascinated by is the California current ecosystem. So within the or Oregon area in California, we have this large ocean current uh, that transports nutrient-rich water. It's an eastern transboundary current that flows down the coast, all the way from southern Vancouver Island and Washington State down to southern California and to Baja. And it transports this nutrient-rich water. It's quite close to shore, usually along the um, continental shelf break. Um, and in addition to nutrient upwelling, it's one of the, the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Um, 
We also know it encompasses four different major layers of water. So I won't get too much into the oceanography here, but what we do know is that it's it's a complex system of multiple different currents, including uh, undercurrents that are warmer uh, that come up from the from the south, um, as well as some eddies and and things that change throughout the season the seasons. And it's highly a highly productive ecosystem. So kind of the goal first for this study was I after in 2015 I was in just really interested in knowing where some of these killer whales that were visiting the Salish Sea were coming from. So for instance, I'd be out in the water with colleagues studying transients and we would see groups of killer whales that were with these known killer whales that we did not know who they were. So I contacted colleagues in, in along the coast and um, what I learned was there wasn't a lot of information. Uh, a lot of the studies had been published, a lot of people uh, had taken photographs and collected or had data somewhere and for me, that was kind of, well, let's figure out how we can answer this question. So that involves some fun road trips. And one of them being uh, down the Oregon coast here, you can see on the right, um, uh, the beautiful Oregon coast, open ocean scenery. And then also down here to a little bit more uh, lush paradise of uh, Point Lobos and the Monterey County area. Um, but also visiting a lot of people. We visited uh, the Whale Watching Center in Depot Bay, talked to naturalists at whale watching companies. Uh, we, we talked with um, individuals at U.S. government, and we were able to consolidate a tremendous amount of data uh, from over 8,000 people. Uh, and currently right now we have a, an interesting network um, in Oregon. We started two or three years ago. It was about three years ago we started where we started a social media, like a Facebook group, that it, where locals, just locals from the Oregon region could join, and fishermen, people out there that could join and share their pictures. Uh, or share reports that they had. And it was so surprising because in Oregon and California, killer whales were considered more of a rarity to see. Mostly you see gray whales along the coast. But I was surprised by the fact that so many locals had hidden photographs that they shared on their personal profiles or shared with their family, that they had information for, for sightings that date back to the early 2000s that we were able to get a hold of just because we were able to share as a community and look at the citizen science. So we were able to gain a, a quite a bit of data from it. So first off though, um, what we found um, through the Oregon initiative um, is a, has been really exciting. The Oregon community has been totally supportive. We are now collaborating with Seaside Aquarium and Oregon State University, and we've been able to consolidate quite a bit of information. Uh, here's a transient killer whale, for example, foraging just in a kelp bed on the outer coast. Um, so a lot of this info is teaching uh, is we're learning a lot more about how these animals are using different habitats. Uh, so, for instance, some of the first studies on killer whales on the outer coast weren't really killer whale focused. There were more surveys of marine mammals um, that were conducted, and one by Green et al. 1992 really looked at the, o the open ocean area, um, mostly as and predominantly for the study of gray whales. Uh, but what they did find for killer whales was that there were orcas that were seen out there, um, and the individual whales that they saw did not match a lot of the whales that were being sighted in the Salish Sea. So, but unfortunately, what the study didn't share was um, if they were offshore killer whales, were they transient, um, were they resident? Like, we, there was no information really to um, tell us if they were part of this uh, outer coast group or animals that hadn't been identified before. So, this is kind of this was kind of one of the first studies, but it kind of gave us a bit of a snapshot of really what needed to be done next. And there hasn't been much published other than this. So the condol consolidating of sightings, we've now been able to identify um, 97 different reports of killer whales, and with most of them we've been able to identify individuals through photo identification, which I'll share some more information about that below. Um, but you can see here we, we've been able to track a lot of these red triangles of groups of transients that are seen in the Salish Sea. So off southern Vancouver Island and Washington State, but we're also seen down the Oregon coast, really close to shore. And then also you can see here um, in the yellow that we also have these outer coast groups that we predominantly see off of California and Monterey that were seen far offshore as well. <clears throat> and then finally, um, what we call these oceanics, they're kind of a big question mark, um, are animals that are seen way offshore all of our settings have been predominantly past the continental shelf break, which you can see here um, out in the abyssal plains. We're not really sure what their 
their niches or their habitat use patterns are. Um, but we're hoping in the next you know little while we'll start to learn a bit more about them. Uh, so this is the coast kind of split up and you can tell with most sightings occur of course um, near areas where there's a lot of people uh, for instance like Newport Oregon um, areas in Depot Bay uh, you can see here Coos Bay Oregon these are all areas that are, are predominantly tourism areas where there's a lot of people that are either on the ocean or fishing um, you know Newport's got a large is that's where Oregon Coast Aquarium Oregon Coast Aquarium and Oregon State University is with the Hatfield Marine Science Center so there's a lot of people that have eyes on the water um, so these are areas that um, we, we get a lot of sightings from which means we're going to be needing to kind of look at this more systematically and, and to address effort but in this area, we do see transient kilograms coming into shallow areas. For instance, this is an adult male we know as T49C. Um, and we can identify him that way um, based on the notches that are seen on his fin. Uh, so this is through the photo identification um, <clears throat> study that was developed by Canadian scientists, in particular Michael Big in the 1970s. And this individual here has been seen up and down the coast, all the way from Southeast Alaska down to Central Oregon. Um, and he, the last couple of years, he's been spending more and more time along the Oregon coast. He's a bit of a nomad, spends a lot of time to himself, uh, but this was taken from a colleague at Oregon State University. So based on this, though, what we're seeing is something really interesting. Um, just preliminarily, we're seeing uh, an interesting trend in the seasonalities. This is um, the number of sightings per month, um, independent sightings per month. Um, and we've noticed, especially since our our um, efforts of trying to track down information, we've been finding that a lot of sightings are occurring in May and June. Um, that could be just because there's also favorable weather. The Oregon coast um, during the winter time can be quite stormy. Um, there could be a, a, a lot of storms and then, you know, not as many people on the water, um, harder to see orcas, but we do see this springtime peak in May and June. And what's interesting is that um, Transient killer whales, especially in the Salish Sea and along the outer coast of Oregon, this this population of coastal individuals um, that we that we're kind of calling the inner coast group, their favorite food, their specialist of harbor seal, and as you can see here in Oregon, uh, in this next map here in Oregon, that period of time when the pupping season takes place, you can see is May to June, so right into that area uh, down here, so April May, sorry. April and May into early June. And this harbor seals go through what we call a, a climb throughout the year. So different areas of the coast will be different times for pupping. Uh, in our southern Vancouver Island, um, a lot of the work that was spearheaded in the 1980s with transient killer whales in 1990s showed that there was a seasonal trend um, in transient killer whale occurrence in the months of July through September. And that was thought to be due to harbor seal the harbor seal pupping season. So it's just something we're kind of just thinking about now, what is really going on um, with the Oregon coast? Are we starting to see predator shifts in response to um, the, the, the pupping season for this, for this population um, of transient killer whales? And do we see this throughout other areas, particularly well-studied areas like Southeast Alaska? So that's a, an area that um, we're kind of looking into currently. Um, here's um, an interesting, uh, map though you can kind of see uh, the first map on the left A's uh, those are the, all the, the, trans the transient killer whale sightings that we know of um, including unknown individuals that we believe to be transients based on group size um, and then on the right though is the number of harbor seal haulout locations that have been um, that have been cataloged by Brian Wright at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and in some of those areas, particularly, um, we do see a lot of transient killer whale occurrence in particular near haul out locations where seals like to get out of the water or are on small reefs or rocks. Uh, we do see a lot of transient killer whales going to those areas. And we have predation events at, at certain haul out sites along the coast here. Um, you can kind of see here, this is kind of a heat map, heat density map showing the, the locations of transient killer whales and also the number of harbor seals. Um, and this is just preliminary. We're kind of still looking at this statistically now to see if there's any significance, um, but hopefully in the near future, we'll kind of have more results on that. Um, the big question though, that the most of our work has been really focused has been on the behavioral ecology of transient killer whales off California. Um, and this is an area that has been poorly studied. There isn't 
much out there to really talk about when it comes to these animals, especially in the peer reviewed literature. And but what we do know is there's a lot of reports that have suggested that transient killer whales in the California region um, are different from the transient killer whales that we see in British Columbia and Washington State and potentially are an outer coast population that spent time in the open ocean. Uh, we also know that from reports from the 1960s that killer whales in this region always showed up in the spring to hunt gray whale calves that were migrating up the coast. Um, and then we also know of reports that the killer whales in this area, um, it's potentially that they're quite a significant impact on the gray whale population. So the, the major driver for the study was um, to understand what the impact transient killer whales may have on gray whales. Um, and other species, particularly the fact that the climate change is causing a lot of issues for gray whales, particularly the last um, couple of years, we've gone through what is called an unusual mortality event along the Pacific coast where gray whales of all ages have been found washed up dead on beaches, um, and even up to over 300 individuals in a span of three or four years. And this is something that's really interesting because killer whales have been considered part of the problem for the situation. I wouldn't say a problem, but they're part of the situation for gray whales that are going through this unusual mortality event. We also know climate change is, put, is likely a cause of changes in Arctic benthic fauna um, that, they, that the gray whales eat, but there's multiple things that need to be looked at. So we decided first, before I get into the behavior of the ecology, I thought I would kind of talk quickly about where transient killer whale behavioral ecology really came from and how it started. Um, first off, it had its infancy and was really spearheaded by researchers in the 1980s and 1990s, particularly by Robin Baird and Lawrence Dill, Lawrence Dill um, when they conducted a, a five to six year study looking at the occurrence patterns and behavior. Um, this was kind of the first studies that really dove into um, the behavioral ecology of these predators. We know quite a few studies that were published from this, uh, in particular one on the occurrence and behavior, another one on ecological and social determinants of group size. These were all really kind of foundation papers that scientists like myself and others are, are really have learned a lot from, as well as looking at social organization. And their study was the, the main study that kind of focused on the relationship between these predators and prey populations, in particular harbor seals. Here's a figure from um, Baird and Dill 1995 that kind of showed um, this seasonal trend in occurrence patterns. Um, we also know that this relationship potentially with harbor seals was kind of the driving force. And now because of these studies, we really do know with the increases in transient killer whale births that have been the last few years, you, you might have seen in the news, that this could be a potential link that the increase in the harbor seal population might be related also to the killer whale um, population increases. So for us off the outer coast, we most of those studies occurred in coastal waters uh, within the continental shelf, inland in protected areas. But for the outer coast, it's a little different. Um, the killer whales out here roam the high seas. This is a large ocean swell with a, an adult male and his, his presumed um, nephew uh, that were uh, with, that we know of these two males. Uh, so what did, we ended up we, we did something similar to what we did in Oregon. We, we ended up tracking down a lot of sightings from whale watchers, from, from um, our surveys as well, going out on the water. Uh, and we were able to get 261 um, independent sightings of killer whales. And each sighting had a uh, date, time, number of whales present, photographs for identification purposes. So we were able to photo identify the entire group of transient killer whales that were seen in each of these encounters. Um, and then also um, we were able to match this up to look at some of the habitat and right now currently I'm, I'm in the final stages of, of finishing uh, this analysis and, and what we're finding is that the transient killer whales that are being seen are spending a lot of time in this canyon system. So off the central coast of California in Monterey, if, you, if you've read any information about it, it's kind of a famous area because of this canyon, this central canyon system that comes really close to shore. Uh, so this big central channel here uh, goes out to almost 420 kilometers offshore out to the deep Monterey Sea Fan, but it also spans some multiple different um, um, convoluted secondary canyons, things like the Soquel Canyon, the Carmel Canyon, and it's one of the areas we know where gray whales, as they migrate north uh, from warm breeding lagoons, they come up along the continental shelf here and they cut across this canyon. 
And often they're with uh, calves that have just been born a few months before, and they kind of move across the canyon as they're heading north uh, to feed their feeding grounds off of Vancouver Island, southeast Alaska, and the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and then it, so really what our knowledge, what we, wanted, what we wanted to know was what was happening, why were transient killer whales spending their time in this area into these deep water features? Is there any sort of relationship? Um, so the first thing we did is starting in 2006, um, the researchers I'm working with, we, we conducted focal follows of transient killer whales, detailed focal follows where we would go out uh, and spend pretty much dawn to dusk following these killer whales, taking photographs, collecting behavioral and um, information notes on their behaviors. We were able to, we, we things like the surfacing patterns, um, distance between individuals, um, any sort of predation event that was seen and any sort of behavior that could be interesting. And what we found was that the killer whales in this region were um, exhibiting some pretty, pretty interesting behaviors. So everything that we classified, we had these activity states we classified from the, the focal follows, we were able to then look at it spatially. And the, the nice thing about research nowadays is that we, we in this time of age, is that we have technology like ArcGIS Pro, um, ArcGIS QGIS to um, look at data and give us a visualization. So for instance, when we took latitude, longitude, or any sort of georeference point of where an individual killer whale was, throughout the encounter, we would take these georeference points. And when we were encountered, encountering killer whales, we were within 50 meters, and this research was all done under U.S. government permit. Um, but within 50 meters, so we were quite close and able to document the movement patterns in relation to our vessel. Uh, so with the activity states based on um, the notes that we were able to take and the, and the detailed observations, we were able to look at a couple of different things. One, foraging um, encompassed uh, what we are defining as a kind of a new uh, type of behavior called shelf break slash canyon foraging. And we know from acoustic studies that some of these um, potential outer coast transient killer whales um, that aren't seen in the Salish Sea that are offshore um, have been recorded offshore near canyon systems. And luckily with Monterey Bay, it's so close to shore, this canyon, that it gives us a, a bit of a, a study area that is accessible. So we found that the killers in their shelf break foraging, which is in the far bottom, you see in the, the right um, corner, bottom corner, and the killer whales typically followed the canyon edge, um, sometimes cutting across. Um, and in here was usually where we saw them ambush gray whale calves, uh, mothers and their calves, was in this area, usually when they were doing this foraging. Uh, it was usually synchronized dives. Uh, individuals in the group would synchronize when they dove, um, coming up long dives, five to 10 minutes at a time, then short dives. But there was no sort of erratic behavior, which you can see. And the next um, type of foraging we, we defined as open water foraging, which open water foraging um, is usually defined by individual whales that are spread out over um, up to a kilometer um, and often very long dives, but very hard to follow, very erratic uh, in their movements. You can see that in the bottom left uh, panel um, where there's it's kind of all over the place. Very, very difficult. Um, and this kind of behavior is actually seen in some of the transients we've studied in the Salish Sea, um, the similar kind of all over the place uh, movements, really difficult to follow. And during these events, we, we do see them predating on marine mammals, particularly things like porpoise and, and, and dolphins um, or seals that are caught out in the open. Uh, prey pursuit, though, uh, it's not on here. It's kind of hard to visualize prey pursuit other than taking photos of the situation when you're out there, um, is uh, defined as when the animals are actually targeting the prey. So from when they encountered the prey to uh, when they've actually killed the prey, uh, and then also as well as feeding. Um, and feeding and prey pursuit are basically what we sum as, summarize as prey handling. And feeding behavior, you can see up in the top um, right, uh, or sorry, the top, yeah, the top right is where you can see all the movements that are kind of kind of all over the place as well. But it's a, the area is very centralized here. Um, and there, this predation event in particular was a gray whale calf that they were feeding on for over two hours. And they were very set localized in their movements, often surfacing in one location um, and feeding on the carcass below the surface. Um, the other one though that we find is traveling, which is the top left. And that is typically seen where killer whales are not feeding. There's no feeding taking place or predation event. It's usually they're, they're trying to get from one location to another um, and synchronized dives um, 
and typically uh, medium length dies between four to five minutes. Uh, socializing was another activity state, um, which isn't uh, shown on here. Uh, it's usually breaching or spy hopping or tail lobbing behaviors like that, or rolling on e rolling on top of each other. Transients don't socialize a lot, but we do see it happen. And then we have resting behavior, um, which isn't isn't on the map here, but um, that is usually where whales are all very much in a tight group, um, doing uh, three to four minute dives all together, barely moving at the surface or making any headway against currents. So this is a, a, a map showing all of these focal follows. Um, and this is um, over a hundred, we had a hundred encounters um, and these are all the focal follows of those. And each one of these behaviors was representative of, um, of what you see, what was seen on for each one was representative of the actual activity state uh, that, was, that was looked at. So uh, just some of the, what we saw on the behavior, um, so majority of time spent was uh, canyon foraging. So up to 26% of the time was canyon foraging, which was very interesting. Um, open water foraging was just a little less, 25. Uh, but definitely they were distinguishable um, when you're observing them uh, being conducted by the whales. Uh, 23 was feeding, which was, that's a very interesting, why would feeding be higher than prey pursuit, and I'll kind of explain that in a second. 9% uh, was traveling, socializing 6, and resting 1%. Um, and what's really interesting here is that with resting, it's very hard to tell transient killer whales don't rest often. Killer whales in general um, rest for short periods of time. But between the feeding and prey pursuit, one of the big things why there was so much more time feeding was the fact that transient killer whales in the California area feed on very large prey. So a lot of time is spent feeding on gray whale calves uh, during the springtime or elephant seals, which are quite large. And sometimes feeding events could take a while. So often they'd stay with the carcass feeding on it for three to four hours or longer. Um, so seasonality though was uh, another um, variable that we wanted to look at. And what how we kind of define seasonality was a little different. So we had 261 um, sightings, independent sightings. But to deal with the fact that, that certain groups might be counted twice, or if we wanted to try to analyze what the presence or occurrence rate is, for how many visits killer whales make to the area or Monterey Bay, we wanted to somehow try to define that. So what we did is we did a concurrent day analysis where we looked at the total number of days that a group of killer whales were seen to be in the area. And if they were seen, we found that if it was five days that um, a group was seen, um, if a group was seen within five days, um, it was considered uh, one encounter. If it's seen the second day, again, that's still considered one encounter. But if it was if the whale group hasn't been seen for five days and then comes back, that would be the second encounter, even if it was the same group. And it really kind of quantifies the fact that the whales have likely left the Monterey Bay and are not in the area using the area. And now they're coming back into the bay. So what we found was based on this was on the natural end or the family group. So depending on the group of transient killer whales um, that we had 325 <laughs> occurrences and that most sightings occurred in the May, April, May period of time. Uh, we also kind of had a smaller peak here in the fall, but most sightings did occur here. And the other thing too is in Monterey Bay, uh, weather is very conducive for whale watching and it occurs all year round compared to other regions of the coast where um, whale watching kind of ends and observer effort to, is is less. Um, down in California, whale watching occurs quite a bit and unless the weather is really bad, um, there's quite a bit of effort on the water, especially in Monterey where it's a, um, there's multiple whale watch companies. Um, and kind of looking here, you can kind of see the, the difference in the different uh, potential availability of different species. Uh, like California sea lions seen throughout the year um, and gray whale calves seen primarily in the spring, elephant seals during molting periods and, and then the winter here uh, during their breeding period. Uh, group size though um, was particularly similar to the Pacific Northwest. We, in my last presentation, it was about five to six animals um, was the percentages of all occurrences that we, we found. Uh, so you can see percent of occurrence of group size. Um, and then also um, the model group size, though, the, the typical group size that we saw, the model group size was six individual whales. <laughs> uh, number of animals during foraging events was very similar, uh, five to six. Um, 
And what was really interesting though, is that sometimes in the spring months, we would have groups of up to 25 whales. Um, and that uh, we usually involved large groups that were hunting gray whale calves um, with multiple individuals. Uh, so what we wanted to take this one step further and that was to kind of try to understand maybe potential relationship of the gray whale migration to transient killer whales. Um, and our colleagues at uh, NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center have been collecting um, gray whale sense, calf census data since the early 2000s um, in this area called Pedras Blancas Light Station where <clears throat> effort-based counts have been quantified and they've looked at the number of calves that have been, that have been um, born over the years. Uh, so what we did is we took the mean num we took that data um, and, and we did the mean number of gray whale calves to look at the mean number of individual killer whales, individually identified agricultural killer whales. So this was the individual, how many individual killer whales were seen or photo identified within uh, the months that we're here. And what we found was that there is definitely a peak. Um, and the gray whale, you can see the gray dash line here for gray whales, it's very short. And the, and the reason for that, it goes from basically zero, there's no counts being in February, um, all the way to March, where there's just a few. And then you get a peak in April and May, and then it right down to zero again in June. And that's because the gray whale calves are actually at this point moved out of the region. They're either up the coast near Oregon or British Columbia, they're getting counts of them anymore. So that peak, the real, the real thing to look at here is the killer whale occurrence and um, individual occurrence. And that's based on this peak here that also happens in April and May. So this study is where I'm currently kind of just finishing up the analysis for, and um, hopefully we'll have some more results soon. Um, diet though was really interesting during these events. Um, we saw all sorts of interesting behavior, especially prey pursuit where uh, killer whales would chase Pacific white sided dolphins or dolls porpoise doing high midair leaps, uh, breaching underneath and ramming. Uh, we saw gray whales being targeted by killer whales where they would try to sub do submergence behavior. Um, and then also as well as um, this catapulting behavior where seals would be um, hit with the killer whales flukes. There's just a few different kind of foraging behaviors that we'd see. Uh, but the prey species were quite diverse, uh, predominantly seen um, in the spring months uh, was California sea lion at 33% and gray whale calves at 30%, um, and then uh, harbor seal, elephant seal, um, porpoise, dolphins, and, and uh, minke whale at the bottom, uh, which were all mostly under 10%. And, and then the rest of the year, though, um, you can see here, uh, so summer, fall, and winter, California sea lion was the predominant prey, especially as the gray whale calf per period came to an end um, and the gray whales had moved north, uh, California sea lion was the dominant prey. Uh, so gray whale predations though were, were quite interesting to watch. Um, and often, sorry for the, the, the imagery, but um, often they were very long prolonged hunts. Uh, killer whales would ambush gray whales as they cut across the canyon. Um, individuals would um, would attack a mother and calf uh, for extended periods of time, up to four to five hours. The behavior usually started with the killer whales would, it, what we call endurance behavior, where they would keep up with the mom and calf until the calf uh, tired, um, and then they would switch tactics. So for instance, right here, um, this is three different behaviors we classified. Um, the top figure, top picture is um, what we call separation behavior. Um, and this occurred after endurance behavior where the killer whales would actively try to push the mom and calf apart. Um, and you can see the calf now is being kind of separated from the group. The next kind of behavior from the mother, the next behavior we kind of classify as what we call incapacitation behavior, where killer whales would randomly, ra or so they would randomly, they would ram and hit the kill the gray whale calves usually towards the upper jaw um, in the throat area and this behavior often was quite debilitating you'd see blood um, and the calf would then be tried to they would try to hold the calf underwater uh, which we call submergence behavior where the killer whales would actually leap on top of the blowhole of the gray whale calf and push it under uh, so back here um, you can kind of see more of that behavior but as the prey as the gray whale calf is killed um, you can see two individuals here sharing um, um, some blubber left over from the gray whale calf. What's interesting though about these predation events too is that especially in the, the head area, something I thought about and I'm, I'm not sure if we'll be able to um, 
you know, prove this, but I've always kind of thought about the fact that what we do see is a lot of the killer whales attacking the head region. And in the lower jaw of a gray whale or most whales, there's a lot of art arteries. Um, and what we do see is a lot of um, blood that comes out towards the end of these predation events. And one thought uh, that comes to mind is potentially these killer whales are um, ramming the, the lower jaw to break it, uh, to make it difficult for the animal to, to lift its head above the surface to breathe. Um, and we do know from scientific literature as well as carcasses that, that have been washed up from killer whales feeding on them that the lower jaw um, and tongue are usually missing. So this um, is a photograph of sometimes, like as mentioned, we do get to view carcasses. This is a carcass that washed up in Monterey Bay. Um, in the photographs, you can see the rake marks on the side. This was a, a juvenile that was killed. Um, and uh, we can kind of get a great opportunity to take a look at some of the some of the, the injuries that are inflicted by killer whales on, on gray whales. But what the big question is, though, is was the ecological connection. Um, and even though it's a it's a terrible thing uh, to witness, um, it is nature and predatory behavior is important. Um, killer whales have an important place uh, that they are in the food chain. And what's interesting is, though, is what really happens to the body of the calf after it's been consumed, because sometimes the calf, only the lower jaw and tongue are eaten, and the rest of the body either washes up on the beach or sinks um, to the bottom. And in Monterey Bay, we do know that the Monterey Canyon is a deep water ecosystem, and that it um, is, and many of these deep water ecosystems are illegal, trophic or nutrient poor. Um, and often a lot of the animals, particularly sleeper sharks and a lot of the benthic um, species rely on carcasses and carrion that um, drift to the bottom. Uh, so the big question is, is how much input potentially do killer whales supply nutrients um, in the form of whale carcasses? Um, uh, though colleagues at Ambari have kind of looked into this, um, looking particularly at how the whale um, bones do uh, disappear over time and what sort of species of marine invertebrates um, visit these carcasses and feed on it during different stages. Uh, and you can see here, this is a carcass that's um, been a gray whale carcass that was on the bottom in the Monterey Bay Canyon, Monterey Submarine Canyon. And you can see um, some of these different species of annelids or, or deep sea worms. Um, we call them whale, uh, whale fall worms, which um, have all, some of these species have only ever been found on, on whale carcasses. So in the way, killer whales may be an important energy transfer um, of nutrients um, or transfer nutrients and energy to these deep systems. Uh, just kind of exciting, um, we have a, based on this behavioral study, we do have a new publication that's uh, been accepted and should be out this week um, from NOAA. It's a field guide um, that's very user-friendly uh, for the California region um, that has a lot of great pictures, a lot of information um, about our research, and um, it's, a, it's a great um, guide to just keep around. Um, and it should be available free of charge um, as a PDF as well from NOAA. Um, lastly, though, um, as, throughout this whole study um, has been collecting a lot of this data for our behavioral work, but also from trying to understand um, the occurrence patterns of killer whales of Oregon. We, we, we started a photo identification study um, and that we managed with Southwest Fisheries, uh, NOAA. And what we wanted to know is what are we seeing out there in the open ocean for individual whales? So you can see here, photo identifications for the, this is an adult male transient, and we can identify them based on the shape of the fin, um, you can also look at scratches on the saddle patch here uh, and that this stays with this individual for life. And um, we, in this way, we can kind of catalog each individual, um, basically like a thumbprint or a fingerprint. And we, over time, we can kind of identify new calves. We can identify relationships. Uh, so our data was collected in multiple ways from our focal follow research and behavioral work that we had conducted. Um, also, whale watchers provided, naturalists provided photos throughout the years, um, as well as through some of the work, especially offshore with NOAA, uh, through their dedicated line transect surveys. Um, they, we were able to get, obtain uh, years of, of photographs of individual whales and was between Point Conception off central, uh, the, the southern range of central California all the way up to Astoria, Oregon. 
um, extending out to about 560 kilometers offshore. Um, and you can see here um, the multiple different sightings. Predominantly a lot came from Monterey, but we did have a lot from other stretches of the outer coast as well. But it wasn't all fun and games. We got spent a lot of time in the field, but we also spent more time in the lab and in the office. Uh, we were very lucky uh, while well, we were in Monterey to spend eight hours on the water, but then eight hours and eight or nine hours in a library uh, or at a lab. It was long, long days. Um, and here's Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, uh, who were nice enough to let us use their facilities, uh, in particular their very, very um, extensive library. Um, and we spent um, probably two or three years um, coming back and forth between British Columbia and California um, and spending time cataloging and collecting data. It was, it was definitely a bit of a detective challenge. And so what did we find? Um, well, we found the study was from 2006 to 2018. Uh, we, we, killer whales were encountered 146 times. Uh, and we analyzed over 113,000 photographs. Um, and a total of 150 individual killer whales were photo identified, um, making up 30 matrilineal groups. And you can see here, this is a female that we know quite well in California named Emma. Um, she's, you can see her, she's OCT30, which means outer coast transient. Uh, so this is kind of how we identify killer whales. Uh, there is this notch here is quite prominent. We know that notch on her and plus her scars and her saddle patch. Um, so we give this alphanumeric identification system that was really kind of developed by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Michael Big and his colleagues. Um, but we were able to use this OCT system. So that means outer coast transient. So OC outer coast transient. And then she's the 30th whale in our catalog would be Emma. But if she had an offspring, um, it would be A, 30A. If she had a second offspring, it'd be 30B. And if her offspring had an offspring, <clears throat> it would be 30 B1, B2, B3, et cetera. And um, over time, you can kind of get this genealogical relationship um, and matrilineal relationship through, through, this, through, this, uh, through this ID system. Um, through the photographic work, though, we were able to track individuals throughout their life. Um, you can see here, this is a, a male that in 2006 was uh, juvenile slash adolescent. Um, and over time, you can kind of see his fin change, his notches form, his scars, just like anybody that might have a, an injury. Um, and as of 2019, actually, we've got photographs of now it's 2023, but um, he's now a full grown adult male. Uh, so this is a matrilineal line. This is that one family, as mentioned. So this is Emma, uh, and this is her daughter, <clears throat> and her daughters are her grandchildren. And then her son, um, her daughter, and her brother. Um, and now we know that she, and it's quite surprising, she herself, even as a grandmother, just had a new calf last year. And her daughter has also had another calf. So we're currently trying to update the catalog as soon as, as, as fast as we can, um, as we start to get through more and more photographs. Um, during this time, though, all these we saw new individuals throughout the entire study period from 2006 to 2018. Um, and so that study was, was quite exciting for us. But what was really, really interesting is during this whole photo ID process and working with our colleagues at NOAA Southwest Fisheries, were some individuals that potentially did not really match or fit in with the transient killer whales that we were seeing even off the California coast. For instance, here's an adult male killer whale that has never been identified before. It was part of a group of three individuals that were witnessed killing a pygmy sperm whale 370 kilometers west of Monterey. Um, the whole entire group could not be matched or identified. Uh, and since then, um, that's weird. Oh, uh, since then, um, you can see here, this is one of the adult males that was part of the group. You can see the cookie cutter bite marks. So these little scars here are from this deep pelagic um, species of shark that lives out in the open ocean. They're only found in water that's roughly around 17 to, to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, we also, we have identified 40 of these oceanic killer whales from 1997 to 2021 and no association have never been seen with other killer whales that in our study population. Um, found predominantly seaward of the continental shelf. And they were all encountered feeding on marine mammals. Not saying that an animal living in an open ocean ecosystem, which in oceanic waters, um, typically oceanic waters are quite devoid of nutrients and, um, and often are oligotrophic and difficult to find 
uh, prey, some of these killer whales may be more generalist and specialist and may feed on fish um, or marine reptiles like sea turtles. Um, but what our observations um, show that is that all the predation events involve marine mammals, uh, including species that we don't see in California, like sperm whales, uh, were, were part of the diet of some of these animals. Uh, so presence of cookie cutter bite marks, uh, which are these, these deep water sharks, as mentioned, uh, that they're only found in offshore. And none of the population uh, trends these people that we see off California or in British Columbia have these cookie cutter bite marks. Uh, so it just shows that these animals may have a distribution for their offshore. We're not sure if they're transient or they potentially, they potentially could be um, an adjacent transient population that's genetically distinct, but they also may be their own thing. They might be of their own ecotype, uh, but currently we don't know. Um, let's quickly go back one slide. This, uh, this is uh, the result of that big study um, was a paper that we published a technical memorandum with the US government um, that came out in 2021. It's the full catalog of all the individual whales uh, that were seen off for off of northern central and northern California and Oregon, um, and is now um, hopefully we'll we'll get a chance to continually producing this every few years as we as we um, watch the population grow. Um, the last thing, the last slide um, I'd like to share is something that's kind of come to mind. And as I mentioned in the initial uh, introduction is potentially this outer coast, inner coast group of transient killer whales in this West Coast stock. And there's kind of a big question mark if there is or if there isn't. Um, so the research we've been conducting hasn't just been in California and Oregon, but we've done a lot of work also in British Columbia, as well as in Washington State um, and Southeast Alaska. And what we're finding is that this potential coastal and outer coast group are whales that uh, do associate infrequently and are unevenly distributed along the whole Pacific coast. So there seems to be different either subpopulations or stocks. Um, and this is part of the work uh, we're conducting at UBC right now. Some of the work I'm doing is part of my thesis. And based on this, you can see this site, this is um, based on 3,450 observations of transient killer whales. Uh, the blue being the inner coast um, and the red being the outer coast, presumed outer coast, you can kind of see there is um, a bit of a longitudinal shift in distribution between these two communities, uh, but there is some overlap. Uh, so this is really interesting, uh, potentially, um, that's something we should, we're, we're currently looking into further to see if there's um, potential protection or habitat differences that need to be addressed for these different stocks. Um, and hopefully the, it, with these results, we can kind of share this with the U.S. and Canadian government to, to further this research. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone. Uh, the, uh, the, here are so many people who are involved in this research, um, including uh, my mentors, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Trites, Dr. Larry Dill, Dr. Ron Eidenberg, and Dr. Rob Butler. Uh, we're all instrumental uh, in, this, in this research, as well as through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Moore and Dr. Marilyn Dalheim, that were uh, two of the major uh, contributors of helping the study really get off um, on a good start. And thank you, Victoria Natural History Society and Phil. Great, and thank you, Josh. Excellent presentation. Um, I'll ask people, uh, for questions. Um, I'll look at the chat. I see we have a few there. I'll just pass those on to uh, Josh. Um, uh, here's a question. On the 1% resting time, our observations are presumably daylight only. So perhaps you could be missing nighttime resting? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, there has been, you know, the, the technology is advancing quite a bit um, with especially tagging work. And we're looking at using DTAGs and using satellite transmitters um, are really useful for testing and looking at fine scale behaviors like resting. Um, nighttime has been shown though, um, and at least in the inner coast transient population in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia through suction cup tags that killer whales do move and actively hunt throughout the night. So being acoustic, um, there is this um, difference in the in their nighttime daytime. There might not be as much of a difference between nighttime and daytime based on the fact that they're acoustically um, reliant on on their sensory system. But that's a good question, um, and this is for based on daytime observations. But that's the nighttime should be addressed more. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, another question here. Did you encounter offshore orcas preying on sleeper sharks? Oh, um, no, uh, but we, we did have one or two sightings of offshores, um, one killing a six scale shark in Monterey, um, which was really neat. Um, we have a catalog database of offshores up to 200 individuals now. Um, and once I can get through this transient work, <laughs> which I, I wish I had all the time in the world, I will, I'll start looking into offshores more. I know um, with NOAA, uh, they're interested in, in me uh, doing an offshore catalog as well. So I'm uh, trying to wade through all this work and it's, uh, it's definitely, well, hopefully we'll get to that, but we haven't seen any sleeper shark predations. Okay. And uh, what are the defenses of gray whales against killer whale predation and how effective is it? That's a great question. Great question. Um, Anti-predator behavior with gray whales, um, it de all depends. So one thing gray whale mums will do is they'll go into kelp beds. Uh, they'll often go right into a kelp, a dense kelp bed, uh, really close to shore. And gray whales are highly adapted for being, being coastal. Their whole entire life is uh, they're benthic feeders. They spend a lot of time in shallow water. They know how to navigate tricky areas like reefs. So <clears throat> killer whales, especially potentially in this outer coast population, which we never really saw any sort of near shore foraging um, or, or the killer whales feeding close to shore, they're mostly in open water, um, are likely not going to go near gray whales that might be hugging the shore. Um, one of the things, though, is that there's a cost benefit here. Um, the, the cost of a mother going in the inside of Monterey Bay it's, it's a, there's a much more distance she has to cover to cover the inside of that bay. Um, and by, and you got to think that the cost is her calf is literally start. She's literally starving at this point. She needs to start feeding. She needs to get to the, to the feeding grounds with this calf. The calf is limited on energy at this point too, as well. It's in colder water than when it was in Mexico. So the cost of her going inside and losing the energy and potentially killing herself and the calf by taking longer time to get up the coast is a, is a gamble. Um, but it's also a gamble cutting across that canyon in open water where transient killer whales are waiting. Um, and we had 20 observations of gray whale predation on calves. Um, we do see gray whale mothers also rolling on their backs. We've had one or two reports where the gray whale mothers will roll on their backs um, and put the calf, place the calf right onto their ventral side, out of the water, out of the way of the killer whales. Um, and then also we've seen gray whale Gray whale mothers use their flukes. Their flukes are barnacle studded and we've seen them quite aggressively um, use them towards killer whales. Um, and a killer whale getting between even a mother and calf, uh, the gray whale mother's about twice the size of a killer whale. So uh, there are certain things like that, uh, but killer whales are pretty persistent and um, they hunt in big groups. Uh, so the next, I think an interesting approach would be to see um, what female gray whales, because we can identify gray whales as well, what female gray whales um, have had successful and have been successful at evading killer whales, and if they've had success over certain periods of time with calves over the years, that would be an interesting approach next to the tape. Mm -hmm. Were any of the intercoastal transients from the Salish Sea spotted during your research observations? Yeah, um, so a big part of my research at UBC is not just looking at Oregon and California. I'm, I'm looking at the entire coast, um, particularly even in southern Vancouver Island and the Sailor Sea, because the Sailor Sea is still part of the California current ecosystem, uh, southern British Columbia. So that is a, a chapter of my thesis that I am currently working on. And we, we as I shared that last map um, that showed basically southern Vancouver Island all the way down to southern California, there was a lot of intercoast sightings in there. Um, for individuals that are seen in the Sailor Sea. Uh, and we've mapped out at least their distribution in that way. Um, but as I said, there's quite a bit of a difference in the longitudinal um, effort based on like photo ID effort where we saw differences um, in individuals that were photo ID. And uh, final question here on the chat, uh, any reports of feeding on leatherback turtles? That's interesting. Um, I'm sure I, I, that's a really great question. Um, there, you know, through the analysis and through our, you know, the peer review, I, I spent a lot of time um, talking and working with Bob Pittman. He's a, a renowned marine mammal scientist at Southwest Fisheries. He's now retired there. He's working at uh, uh, Oregon State University. And he wrote a paper on um, a short note on a group of killer whales off Monterey 
um, that were quite far offshore, once again, past the continental shelf break, that were preying on a leatherback sea turtle. Um, so unfortunately, there was no photographs of the whale, so I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to identify them. I tried. He didn't have any. He said the weather conditions weren't really great. Um, but they had been able to get genetic analysis of the carapace of the, of the sea turtle and were able to clarify. Uh, were able to quantify that it was a leatherback or able to genetically look at it. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, here's another question. Uh, the orcas filmed preying on great whites off the Farallon Islands. Were they OCT or something else? That's a great question. So um, there was a paper published in 2019 by a colleague. Um, I've talked to quite a bit. His name is Salvador Jorgensen. He's a white shark scientist out of Monterey Bay Aquarium. He's a really nice gentleman. I've had great, he's just great to talk with. And uh, he, him and I chatted and <clears throat> there was a mistake in the paper. Um, and I kind of wish I would have chatted with him before they published it, but that's the thing with publishing. Um, but he admitted to it. And the killer, that there was a predation event at the Farallon Islands um, in 95 or 97 that was involved. It was one of those years that involved a great white shark. And he wrote this paper showing that the killer whales, when they predated on white sharks or when there was killer whales in the areas, that white sharks disappeared for extended periods of time. It's very similar to the studies that are happening in South Africa. Um, but the killer whale that predated the white shark wasn't a transient. Um, we're not even really sure what it was. The individual was part of a group that was termed the, the um, LA pod. Um, which was a group of about 17 individuals that were only seen in Southern California up into Northern California, but then also were seen in Mexico. Uh, but that pod after 1997 disappeared, has never been seen again. Uh, hmm. We don't know if they went south to Mexican waters or further out to the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Uh, a lot of them had uh, morphologies that were a bit different, like darker saddle patches that were more brown. Um, and also a lot of them had these little oceanic um, barnacles called Xanabinalis on the back of the fins. Um, so these animals may have just been out, it may have shifted their distribution for a few years. Um, and they were involved in the predation on the white shark. But in the paper, they had, they had made it sound if, it's, if it was a transient head had done it, but it was it was very much a gray area on where this group of killer whales that predated the white shark, where do they fit in in the whole killer whale ecotype story. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions there? Thomas, do you have a question? I, I do. Uh, very, very inspiring talk. Uh, great, oh, incredible stuff. amount of work. Uh, and I initially had three questions, but the first one about nocturnal activity was answered already. Uh, but my other one is, uh, you're probably familiar with some of the literature on uh, the landscape of fear, and even top level predators apparently exhibit in some stages of their life, a landscape of fear. So in, in all your observations, can you, can you reflect on what that might be for this top level? Uh, predator. Is yeah, it, you know, it? oh, you know, I, I, I don't like for them exhibiting um, fear on another species. I know, I know, I've had so many great conversations with Larry Dill, um, who's kind of, uh, he's, he's the one of the the major contributors to this part of um, behavioral ecology. Um, is the fact that you know we we do believe, especially with the the more studies that we see on transient killer whales in the Salish Sea in response to pinnipeds. We do think that potentially with the increases in the pinnipeds, we are also seeing increases in transient killer whales, and that may be shifting the habitat use patterns of harbor seals. And that's one thing that seems to be kind of the big question, especially with harbor seals predating on salmon or, or pinnipeds feeding on salmon near river systems and becoming these problem pinnipeds um, that we've been hearing about from fishermen and that if potentially the the fact that killer whales may be redistributing harbor seals could be a potential uh, area that's being looked into. I know there's a few researchers that are, are, are looking at that. Um, and that's, it's, it's true because in, we know that when a harbor seal is encountered in open water, their defenses are zero. Um, the chances of a harbor seal being able to get away when it's in the open ocean or, you know, not near a haul out site is, I've I don't think I've ever seen one and I've seen numerous predation events. So if there's more transient killer whales be using the area, especially the Salish Sea, I wouldn't doubt that harbor seals will be spending more time near 
inshore areas where they're protected potentially in kelp beds or near their haulout site. And that could bring them into conflict or competition with fisheries. That's a big question. And I, that could be part of that, you know, seascape of fear um, in a way um, that could be influenced by transients. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, uh, there have been a couple of movies, but it's only been 3 million years when uh, Megalon disappeared. And uh, presumably uh, Megalon itself would have been probably the ultimate top level predator in the Pacific. Uh, think so? Oh, I, I totally think so. I think, um, you know, between that and Basilosaurus uh, was, uh, you know, a, a, an archaic whale. Um, there's a few that I think would have shifted entire food webs. Um, and yeah. I, I, you know, potentially even, I, I don't know too much about the, the paleontology behind um, large cetaceans, but I could see that potentially being an issue for whale diversification and evolution mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. I, I was lucky, Tom. You were one of my professors, so I, I'm very lucky. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> okay. All right. So, so my last question is more uh, not so much ecological, but form and function. And uh, the males are often uh, characterized by the very, their very large dorsal fin. And what I wanted to know is, uh, relative to their mass, is their dorsal fin larger than what you'd expect relative to their mass? I, I, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I would say no. Um, male killer whales are almost twice the size um, in, in mass than females. They're actually, they're not that much longer. So a male is about 28 feet, 28, 29 feet. Females are about 26, um, typically. But the the weight though of males is almost twice. I mean, we've got males that are you know been uh, been uh, measured and estimated to be around fifteen thousand pounds, and females are around eight thousand. Um, so, I think that in general generality, I think that probably the dorsal fin size based on weight is or mass is probably on par. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that it? It it is it maybe a stabilizer? Is that is that its main function? <clears throat> It could be. I mean, it, it, there's a couple of different things like the dorsal fin of males um, may be a stabilizer, especially because males may, due to their mass, may be able to dive longer um, and for, and, you know, deeper than females can. We know that with um, beluga whales, that male belugas actually can dive longer and deeper than females can. So there's a bit of spatial um, segregation between the sexes. Um, we do know too with trans or killer whales, it might be potentially a sexual characteristic um, between the two with um, males being, um, it might be something that the females are, you know, mm -hmm. very much yeah. more attracted to. Sure. Or the last one I could think of is that even the female dorsal fin of a, tr of a killer whale is very different, than, is very much larger than most other cetacean species out there, even the female. And another thing could be um, potential thermal regulation. Killer whales are found throughout the world, tropical and um, uh, polar regions, so possible thermal regulation, especially if you're going between areas that are, are, and especially for an animal that's that heavy and has that much weight, being able to get rid of heat or absorb heat might be beneficial um, for for their body. There's a lot of connective tissue and, and circulatory, um, a lot right. of uh, veins and connective tissue there. I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Tom, for those questions. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to chime in with a question? Um, I was, I guess I was just wondering if, um, in your study area, is there a resident population on the, of Oregon or, and if so, do they interact at all with the transient? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a question. So we do know that, um, resident killer whales, like the Southern residents and the Northern residents, um, formed a specific ecotype. Um, the southern residents, though, occur all the way down to down to central California off Monterey. I actually encountered uh, uh, L pod um, from the southern residents in Monterey in 2019, uh, which was really interesting. Right in the spring, um, I also found that we uh, we've seen we've had tons of reports of southern residents off of Oregon. Um, so the res southern residents do extend down that far south. There's no interaction with transients, though, um, that we know of. And they seem to have two different habitats. A, a lot of the time, the outer coast transients spend time near the continental shelf break, as what the majority of our reports have been from, um, like near the canyon edges or just over canyons. 
for the resident killer whale, spend a lot of time near fishing banks when they're in offshore waters, but not too far. They're usually in shallow fishing banks where they're, you know, going for Chinook salmon or, or mm -hmm. coho. Um, so there is overlap, but as similar to the Salish Sea, where we don't see interactions between transients and residents, we, we see the same pattern um, in California and Oregon. Good. Okay, uh, there's a, a number of other comments in the chat uh, saying uh, what an excellent presentation. I'll let you have a look at those. Um, so are there any more any more questions? Oh, here Annette, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> One of my other professors is on here. <laughs> oh, good. Well, so with that, everyone. I'll... Um, say uh, thank you very much, Josh. It was a very good presentation and uh, we uh, I hope to be in touch and keep up with your work. Uh, good luck with it. Um, so you're just about to launch on a PhD, did you say? Earlier? Yeah, so I, I defend in the spring here <laughs> and uh, uh, UBC and uh, I'm in talks right now to join uh, potentially Oregon State University. Um, it's right. at the Happy Marine Science Center to start a PhD. And I'll give you a little secret. Um, I think the next steps might be to quantify this with satellite tagging um, to look at extensive habitat and behavioral uses. So uh, by Kilolos in California and Oregon. So we're kind of in the initial stages of discussing this with other researchers and at NOAA on that. So I'm pretty excited. I'm on the 2023 cruise. I'm, I'm scheduled to be on the NOAA cruise. I'll be out to sea for two months to look for killer Ooh. whales and uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll get biopsy samples. So it's a big West Coast cruise up and down the entire coast. So oh, right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my feet wet again. It's been a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'll sign off now. And thank you all for your questions. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Josh.